Among the first units deployed to the Persian Gulf after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in August 1990 were aircraft carriers. No less than eight American carriers would become involved, together with the French carrier Clemenceau. The aircraft operating from these carriers would play a significant part in the air campaign against Iraq. But also taking part in the Gulf War were two veterans of the Second World War the mighty American battleships Missouri and Wisconsin. It had been on the deck of the Missouri that General Douglas MacArthur had taken the Japanese surrender in 1945. It was this type of warship which the aircraft carrier had replaced as the principal surface vessel during the latter half of World War II. This was especially in the Pacific, where carriers fought each other at ranges of hundreds of miles. Carrier aircraft also helped to soften up the Japanese defenses during the island hopping campaigns which brought the Allied forces ever closer to mainland Japan. Indeed, at the end of the Second World War, the US Navy could boast a strength of nearly 120 carriers. Land-based aircraft had played a major part in the war against the submarine, especially in the longest-running campaign of all, the Battle of the Atlantic. Here, maritime patrol aircraft accounted for nearly half of the German U-boat sunk. Thus, during the years 1939 to 45, aviation had shown itself to be just as vital a component of naval warfare as it had on land. While land-based jets had been used in combat during World War II, the navies still relied entirely on piston engine types in 1945. This, however, would soon change. The American McDonnell FH-1 Phantom began carrier flight trials in July 1946, just six months after the British had carried out their first carrier jet tests. By the end of the decade, the Phantom I had been replaced by the more powerful Banshee and Grumman Panther. When the Korean War broke out in June 1950, both the US and Royal Navies deployed carriers. They carried a mixture of piston-engined aircraft and jets. During the early months of the war, the United Nations forces were penned into the southeast corner of the country, around the port of Busan. The nearest air bases were 200 miles away in Japan, but the carriers were able to operate much closer to the front line and could provide more responsive support to the ground forces. 
They also played their part in escorting the heavy bombers on their raids against targets in North Korea. In September 1950, General Douglas MacArthur put into effect a daring plan to break the deadlock on the Busan perimeter. This plan was based on an amphibious landing to be made at Incheon, the port which supplies the South Korean capital, Seoul. Simultaneously, the UN forces would break out from Busan, forcing the North Koreans to look in two separate directions. The Incheon landings gave the carriers the opportunity to play the role they knew so well from the island hopping campaigns in the Pacific during 1942-45. The landings themselves were highly successful, catching the North Koreans totally by surprise. The net result was that the North Koreans were driven back into their own country and right up to its northern border with communist China. Naval aviation supported this rapid advance, as it did the subsequent UN withdrawal in the face of a massive Chinese onslaught at the end of November 1950. When the war stabilized in the early summer of 1951, on a line close to the 38th parallel, carrier aircraft continued to play their part but they operated mainly against ground targets. The aircraft carriers off Korea operated in all types of weather and made an invaluable contribution. But several lessons for naval aviation emerged from the conflict. The Korean War confirmed that the big fleet carrier was a vital component of modern warfare. But it was also made apparent that to use carrier aircraft to attack targets within range of warship guns was not cost effective. For this reason, the US Navy preserved some of its mighty battleships. The carriers then in service were finding it difficult to cope with ever more powerful jet aircraft. Hydraulic catapults had been effective up to a point in imparting the necessary velocity to attain flying speed. But the energy wasted in the system limited their potential. The answer was developed in Britain, the steam catapult. After tests with blocks of equivalent weight to an aircraft, dummy planes without pilots were used. Then piston-engined aircraft. Finally, jets were used to prove the system which draws steam from the ship's engines and uses a pressure valve to impart the necessary force to a piston attached to the catapult trolley. The mirror landing site, which enabled the pilot to line up his aircraft so as to achieve a shallow glide onto the deck and make a more accurate landing, was also introduced by the British. Even so, the carrier jet pilot still faced problems. If his aircraft failed to catch the arrestor wire, the pilot had to immediately take off and try again, what American naval aviators called a bolter. To do this, the pilot applies full throttle as he hits the wire. Even so, he was sometimes unable to get airborne again, and for this reason, a barrier was placed across the flight deck, both to catch him and to protect other aircraft. Jets, however, would sometimes go through this net, causing damage to themselves and other aircraft parked on the flight deck. The angled flight deck was therefore evolved by the British. Today it is installed on all large flat tops. <laughs> 
Besides giving the landing aircraft a clear deck, the angled flight deck also enables takeoffs to be made simultaneously using the bow deck catapults. Furthermore, additional takeoffs can take place from rear catapults when there are no aircraft landing. But controlling flight deck operations became more complicated. Nowadays, many aircraft carriers get over this problem by using a model to ensure that an aircraft is not in the wrong place at the wrong time. The late 1940s and early 1950s also saw the flying boat gradually phased out of service, although the last American squadron was not decommissioned until 1966. This was because a new breed of land-based long-range maritime patrol aircraft, like the British Avro Shackleton, was coming into service. Another example was the American Lockheed P-2V Neptune. The float plane, which warships had carried as their personal eyes over the horizon, was also superseded. In its place came the more versatile helicopter. The value of the helicopter in amphibious assault operations led to the development of a new type of carrier called the helicopter assault ship by the Americans and commando carrier by the British. But the cornerstone of naval aviation remained the large fleet carrier, with the British employing theirs largely in the Indian Ocean, as support for their campaigns in Malaya, Borneo and Aden. The American carriers, on the other hand, were more closely involved with the Cold War. Under NATO agreements, two carriers were always on station in the Mediterranean. A further three were deployed in the Western Pacific. These carrier groups were able to respond to a number of crises. One such crisis occurred in 1958, when carriers of the US 7th Fleet supported a landing by US Marines in Lebanon to help quell internal unrest and protect the country from possible attack by neighboring Syria. No shots were fired in anger, however, and the force was withdrawn after four months. In the 1960s, however, Vietnam was to present American naval aviation with a grueling challenge. Naval jets fired the first offensive shots of the American involvement in Vietnam striking at North Vietnamese naval installations in August 1964, after patrol boats had fired on US warships in the Gulf of Tonkin. Thereafter, the American carriers found themselves waging a long and arduous campaign. The carriers were deployed to one of two areas, Dixie Station and Yankee Station. A new carrier would serve first in Dixie, supporting the ground forces operating in South Vietnam, and then move to Yankee for airstrikes against North Vietnam. A carrier could expect to remain on station off Vietnam for six months. At the height of the war, each carrier operated a 12-hour flying day, midnight to noon 
or noon to midnight. Sometimes up to 15 planes an hour were being launched. This put an enormous burden on the flight deck crews. Yet, as one naval aviator commented, Every time you taxi up on that catapult, you know that your life is in the hands of those guys down there who are hooking you up and checking your airplane. You never have any doubt at all that they're going to be completely reliable. That's why there's such a feeling of respect and affection between the pilots and the flight deck personnel. But once the aircraft had taken off, their crews were on their own. Besides combating North Vietnamese MiG fighters, the pilots also faced the threat of missiles and guns fired from the ground as they struck at their targets. Then they turned for hope to begin the whole process all over again. The Phantom II was one of three naval planes that bore the brunt over Vietnam. Another was the tactical strike A-7 Corsair. The third was the A-6 Intruder, all-weather attack aircraft. Eventually, the last aircraft sorties of the day returned to the carrier. But the work on board was by no means finished. Much more needed to be done before many of the crew could get to their bunks for much needed sleep. The carrier had to be refueled. Stocks of bombs and other munitions expended during the day had to be replenished. On top of this was maintenance of the aircraft. For every hour that they spent in the air, they needed 40 to 50 man-hours of servicing 
to keep them fully operational. Thus, the crews of carriers off Vietnam found themselves working a 16 to 18 hour day, seven days a week. With pressures like this, it's hardly surprising that accidents occurred. In July 1967, the carrier Forrestal was the victim of such a disaster. At the time, she was in action and operating at high intensity. A Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile accidentally went off on Forrestal's flight deck. It struck another aircraft and caused a major conflagration. It took the crew some time to get the fire under control and put it out. The resultant damage was such that Forrestal was forced to return to the United States for major repairs. Similar accidents occurred on the carriers Enterprise and Oriskany. These were expensive penalties to pay for the demands being imposed on the carriers and their crews. The strain on the carriers was, however, relieved to a degree in 1968. The veteran battleship New Jersey was taken out of mothballs and deployed to Vietnam. she fired eight times as many rounds from her 16-inch guns as she'd done in the Pacific during 1943-45. By the 1970s, most of the world's major navies were operating carriers, including the French, who had two fleet carriers in service. The Vikrant was the flagship of the Indian Navy. The one notable exception was the Soviet Union, because during the two world wars, the Red Navy had operated largely in enclosed waters, the Baltic and Black Sea. In 1956, however, Admiral Sergei Gorshkov had become Naval Commander-in-Chief, a position he would hold for almost 30 years. He saw the influence that a large blue water navy, like that of the United States, could play in world affairs, and determined to match it. Soon, Soviet warships were increasingly seen on the high seas. But Gorshkov realized that his navy would never be truly effective until it had aircraft carriers. Consequently, during the 1970s, the Kiev-class carriers began to enter the Soviet Navy. And among the Soviet naval aircraft developed was the Yak-36 jump jet. This was largely copied from the British Sea Harrier, which had come into service at the beginning of the 1980s. By this time, the British had given up large fleet carriers on budgetary grounds. But the Sea Harrier, operating from light carriers, enabled the Royal Navy to retain a fixed-wing capability. However, the aircraft could not take off vertically with a full load of munitions. A serving naval officer therefore designed a ski wrap, which overcame the problem. This was only just in time, for naval aviation was about to undergo its most severe test since 1945. On the 2nd of April, 1982, 
Argentinian forces invaded the Falkland Islands deep in the South Atlantic. They quickly overwhelmed a small British garrison and declared the Malvinas, as they called the islands, part of Argentina. The following day, the Argentinians also seized South Georgia, 800 miles to the east. On the 5th of April, a naval task force left Britain to sail 7,000 miles to reclaim the islands. It was built around two light carriers, Hermes and Invincible. These had a combined total of just 20 sea harriers on board. Facing them, the Argentine Air Force could boast some 200 fixed-wing aircraft, including French-built Mirage 3s, as well as Super Etendard, Israeli-built Daggers, and American-built A4 Skyhawks. These aircraft could operate from the airfield at Port Stanley, or from air bases in southern Argentina, 200 miles away. The Argentinians also had an aircraft carrier. Given that the nearest land base available to the British was Ascension Island, still nearly 4,000 miles from the Falklands, the odds seemed stacked against them. Nevertheless, on the 12th of April, as the task force continued to steam south, the British declared a total exclusion zone covering a radius of 200 miles from the Falklands to all Argentine ships. The first threat faced by the task force was submarines, of which the Argentinians had four. This was where the British naval helicopters came into their own. These used sonar buoys, which, dunked into the water, can detect the noise of a submarine's engine. Once detected, the helicopter could attack it with sonar torpedoes. Long-range maritime patrol aircraft can also detect submarines with sonar buoys. Their effectiveness was shown in January 1997, during a solo round-the-world yacht race. Britain Tony Bullimore's boat turned turtle in the Southern Ocean trapping him in a small air pocket. Sonar boys dropped by a Royal Australian Air Force Lockheed P-3 Orion picked up his knocking on the inside of the hull. This confirmed that Bullimore was still alive. An Australian frigate was then able to rescue him. However, the submarine threat to the British task force en route to the Falklands never really materialised. But both sides also employed maritime patrol aircraft to shadow each other's ships the Argentinians using specially converted C-130 Hercules. In this way, the British knew that the Argentine fleet had put to sea. Indeed, only adverse weather prevented its carrier from launching an air attack against the task force. However, the British submarine HMS Conqueror also shadowed and then sank the cruiser General Belgrano. This put paid to the Argentine naval threat. By now, the British task force was only 200 miles away from the Falklands and within range of land-based aircraft. For the Harrier pilots, the moment of truth had arrived. Now my world was coming alive. My mind was clear of all the subjects that had given me a pain over the past few days, and I concentrated on what I loved best. Nozzle stop set to 50 degrees. Check engine with nozzles down. Looks fine. Nozzles aft. The whole aircraft nodded in tune to the movement of the nozzles. 
Set RPM at 55%. Nav lights to steady. Check the flight deck crew are to one side. Check the green light from Flyco. And even before the flight deck officer had brought his Star Wars green wand down to the deck, I'd hit the throttle to the left-hand corner and released the brakes. The ski jump loomed ahead of me and then disappeared from view. I was pressed down in my seat for a second, and then I was free. The target of this initial Sea Harrier operation was Port Stanley Airfield. The strike took the Argentine defenders by surprise. The Harriers then returned to the carriers. The relief and elation of the pilots was plain. Vulcan bombers from Ascension also attacked the airfield, but it involved numerous air refuelings to get them there and back. All this caused the Argentinians to dismiss any ideas of operating their harder-hitting aircraft from Port Stanley airfield. Further success for the task force took place on that same day when a Harrier shot down an Argentine Mirage with a Sidewinder missile. But on the 4th of May, two Super Etonda aircraft from the mainland flew low towards the task force. They were armed with Exocet air-to-surface missiles, which they launched at a point 30 miles from the British ships. The ship-borne radars detected some activity, but the operators could not decide whether a missile attack was imminent. Next moment, an Exocet penetrated the Type 42 destroyer HMS Sheffield amidships on her starboard side. Even though the missile did not explode, its remaining fuel started a fire which could not be controlled. Sheffield had to be abandoned and was later sunk. The arrival of her badly burnt survivors on board Hermes not only affected her crew, but the whole of the task force and the British public, who saw it and the stricken destroyer on their television screens at home. It was the first time that a British warship had been lost in action in more than 35 years. This was real war. But the loss of HMS Sheffield was also a stark reminder of how vulnerable surface ships were to air attack. Yet the British ships had sophisticated radars and various means of defeating a missile attack. What had gone wrong? Once detected, the missile can be shot down by another missile. Sheffield was equipped with sea dart for this purpose. Sea dart does, however, have a minimum range. But other ships were equipped with the shorter range Sea Wolf, which is designed to cope with missiles within Sea Dart's minimum range. Alternatively, Sheffield could have fired chaff. Chaff is made up of strips of aluminium foil, designed to confuse the missile's radar guidance system. But the main problem was the failure to detect the Exocet. This seems to have been caused, at least in part, by Sheffield's satellite communications interfering with her radars. The American solution to the problem is the Aegis-class cruiser, a specialist air defense ship 
The Aegis's wide range of weapon systems can engage up to 20 targets at any one time. Computers are used to work out the priorities of target engagement. But back to the Falklands. The next phase was the actual landings. These took place in sheltered San Carlos Bay on the 21st of May. They were unopposed. the British shipping gathered in San Carlos water was a tempting target. The Argentinians took full advantage, but could not afford to expend further exocets in their attacks on the ships at anchor in San Carlos. They had possessed only five exocets at the outset of hostilities. Consequently, they relied on iron bombs. These dumb bombs scored a number of hits on the British ships. Some of these hits were fatal. But many bombs had been incorrectly fused, and hence the damage was not as severe as it might have been. The Sea Harriers were now put under severe pressure. Pilot fatigue was growing. They had, however, been reinforced by additional aircraft sent out by ship from Britain. The Harrier's extreme maneuverability came into its own, and it shot down a number of Argentine aircraft. This helped to secure the beachhead, and the advance to Port Stanley could now begin. The Argentinians were not yet finished in the air. On the 25th of May, another Exocet attack was launched, the Super Etendard being refueled en route by a C-130 tanker. Chaff caused the missile to veer away from the warships, but it fatally damaged the merchant vessel Atlantic Conveyor. On board were eight transport helicopters, whose loss would severely slow down the advance on land. Then, on the 8th of June, Two British logistic landing ships were attacked by Skyhawks, suffering severe damage and heavy casualties. Six days later, British troops entered Port Stanley. The Falklands had been regained, but it had been a close-run thing since one or two more ships sunk could have spelt disaster. As it was, it showed that the warship was still vulnerable to attack from the air. But the 1980s also saw naval aviation in action in the Mediterranean. In 1983, an American naval task force deployed off the Lebanon coast in support of multinational efforts to bring peace to that troubled country. Among the ships present was the New Jersey, which lobbed her 16-inch shells into the hills above Beirut. The battleship era had still not been confined to the history books. Elsewhere in the Mediterranean, American carrier aircraft had a number of brushes with Libyan jets. 
These incidents came about largely through Libyan efforts to prevent American ships from sailing too close to the coast. Two occasions, in 1981 and 1989, F-14 Tomcats were forced to shoot down Libyan fighters. These incidents illustrated how a carrier group can defend itself against air attack. Each American carrier has a strong escort, designed to protect it against all forms of attack. The carrier also has on board E-2 Hawkeye aircraft, with their distinctive radar domes. These provide long-range warning of an impending hostile air threat. The carrier's principal defense against air attack is the Aegis cruiser. The Hawkeye detects a hostile aircraft. The F-14s are scrambled, but engage at a minimum range of 60 miles from the carrier to avoid being shot down by the task group's missiles. This is further reinforced by a safety no engagement zone between 60 and 30 miles of the group. Below 30 miles, defense is solely by missile. But there is another safety zone to the rear of the group to enable the aircraft to land back on the carrier. In the 1991 Gulf War, however, no coalition warship was actually attacked by an Iraqi aircraft, although the threat was there. During the months of Desert Shield, when the buildup of forces was taking place, naval aviation played its part in enforcing the blockade in the Persian Gulf which prevented merchant vessels from reaching Iraq. Helicopters were especially useful in checking out merchant ships and supporting boarding parties. Naval aviation also protected the mass of vessels bringing in supplies and equipment as part of the coalition building. But when Desert Shield became Desert Storm in the early hours of the 18th of January 1991, the naval forces were ready to play their part. Desert Storm opened with a barrage of Tomahawk cruise missiles, some fired by the battleships Missouri and Wisconsin. Carrier aircraft also struck at targets in Kuwait and continued to do so throughout the five weeks of the air campaign. Coalition naval forces also had to be on guard against the small Iraqi navy. The helicopter, armed with anti-ship missiles, played a leading part in hunting down and sinking Iraqi patrol boats. Indeed, the Iraqi navy had ceased to exist by the end of the war. <laughs> 
Yet while the naval aspect of the Gulf War might have appeared secondary to that in the air and on the ground, it was nevertheless crucial, especially in maintaining a threat from the flank to the Iraqi forces in Kuwait. The war also once more reinforced the primacy of the aircraft carrier in naval operations, even though its one-time rival, the battleship, was still active. The large fleet carrier, capable of carrying nearly 100 aircraft, is still a formidable weapon and likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. For the 6,000 or so people who serve in each of these mighty vessels, it's like living in a small floating city, a city which can be away from land for up to six months at a time. The various departments in the ship, from the bridge to the engine room, all have a vital part to play in the smooth running of the vessel. But for the new crew member, it can be a bewildering place, with literally miles of passageway in which to become lost. Life on board cannot be all work. The sailors must be able to relax when off duty, and good food is essential to maintaining morale. The modern fleet carrier has its own internal television system and even prints its own newspaper. This too helps morale, for a carrier is only as good as its crew. Physical fitness too is vital, and mini gyms are in constant use when the flight deck cannot be used for exercise. Be they air crew, radar operators, engineers or cooks, all those on board operate as a single team. At the bottom line, their task is to ensure that when called for, their aircraft strike quickly and sure. The crew of a large fleet carrier never know when and where the next crisis in the world might blow up. If and when it does, it's likely that among the early forces deployed, a carrier group will be at the forefront.